This is the Game of Life. Coming up, an interview with the amazing and dynamic CEO of the Christie House, Amanda Altman, talking about how we can help our kids socially and emotionally and always through the power of mentoring. Right. Welcome to the Game of Life. I'm Gail Nelson, President and CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters and your host. And I am pleased to have with me today the CEO of Christie House, Amanda Altman. Let's get into a little detail about Amanda. Uh, Christie House, first of all, is a nationally accredited, state-recognized children's advocacy center for Miami-Dade County. Christie House provides therapy, family advocacy, and emergency assistance to more than 1,500 sexually exploited and abused children and their families every year. Amanda is an attorney, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and humanitarian. So I'm so pleased to have this dynamic executive and proven leader on the game of life. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me, Gail. I'm just thrilled to be here today. Excellent. Well, let's tell me about the mission and the services uh, that Christy House provides, Amanda. Yes, so the mission is really twofold. One, we help to heal and empower children who have suffered from trauma, primarily the trauma of sexual abuse and sex trafficking. But we also work really hard towards eradicating um, child sexual abuse and sex trafficking. So we have a, a big prevention arm as well. And I like to tell people when they ask me what my goal is, it's to put myself out of a job. I hope that someday we don't need a Christie house because we don't have these problems in society. So that's our mission. We offer a wide variety of services. We have about 20 full-time mental health professionals on staff to provide therapy. We have case coordinators. Uh, we work closely with the state attorney's office and the guardian ad litem program for cases that are um, being prosecuted. So we offer just a, a wide variety of wraparound services for our clients and their families because like you, we recognize that kids need a, a stable environment and to grow up in, and that's really the only way they're going to fully heal and recover from their trauma. Absolutely, Amanda, and we are so fortunate to have Christy House in our community. As we think about stability and kids, to your point, as we deal with this pandemic, the reality of, of COVID-19, how has it impacted children from your vantage point? Well, really negatively, unfortunately. So one of the things that we've been really concerned about at Christie House is the isolation that kids have been facing. So the pandemic has really cut off the, their social interaction. For a long time, it was cutting off their ability to even go to school. We know that about 40% of child abuse cases are reported by school teachers, counselors, or other school personnel. And what we saw in the beginning of the pandemic was really scary, actually, Gail. We were seeing um, a really big decline in the reported incidents of child abuse, but we really had a feeling that the actual incidents were increasing because children were at home without other adults having eyes on them. About 90% of abuse cases are at the hand of a family member or a very close trusted friend. So right there, you're isolating children, perhaps in the homes where they're being abused and with their abusers, and you have nobody on the outside who has eyes on these kids, that's a perfect storm and a, and a recipe for disaster. And these kids just didn't have an outlet. So we know that they're suffering from a lot of mental health issues. Um, and then you might add other things like abuse on top of it. And wow, that could really um, end with a lot of trauma for kids, unfortunately. So we've been doing our best to do a lot of education um, and outreach. And I've been really trying to be out there. We've been using our social media platform. Uh, we have found a few silver linings. For example, we do a lot of training. As I said, we have a huge prevention arm. And uh, we, we've kind of shifted to doing a lot of online trainings through webinars, and we've been able to reach a lot more people that way. So, you know, we're really making every effort, but we're starting to see now that the reported cases are going up. And I expect that when kids are full-time, 100% back in the classroom, that unfortunately we're gonna see a spike. And so, you know, we need, we're preparing now at Christie House. We're prepared, we've always been prepared. Um, but, you know, you have to think, you think over the last year, Gail, there's been a lot of things going on. The pandemic is really just one of them. We've been also really facing 
um, social injustice and coming to terms with that. And, and finally, there's been people who are really stepping up and leading the way there. And, you know, that can be really traumatic for kids as well to see all of the things that they see on TV and the internet. And so, you know, while it's wonderful that we're we're facing these issues head on for kids, it can be traumatic to see these things. So we're just really concerned, especially with the isolation that's gone on because of the pandemic, that all of these things are, are just really creating um, a, a negative environment for kids. Absolutely, Amanda. And we're in this together. And as we yeah. think about how we can detect, well, hopefully prevent detect and address the issues that these children and their families face uh, and the pandemic just added insult to injury it really just compounded what was already there uh, and so to that point amanda how do what practical tips uh, more appropriately put what practical tips uh, can you give to parents mentors caregivers on how to identify uh, if someone was a victim, if you will, that identify signs and symptoms of someone who might have been a victim. Sure. So, uh, you know, with physical abuse cases, sometimes it can be a little easier to spot because you might see bruises that can't be explained or that have sort of an irrational explanation or what parents of kids get very defensive when you ask them about it. But with things like sexual abuse or even online bullying or just general bullying of kids or other kinds of trauma can be a little more difficult to spot the signs. But really, you know, I always tell people, one, look for a change in the child's behavior, if they become withdrawn, more aggressive, um, anything towards the extremes, that could be concerning. If you find that a child is showing up to school with um, expensive items and they can't account for them, that can also be a sign of trafficking at times or or abuse where the, where the abuser is giving them gifts. Uh, so those are things to look out for. Um, also watch their interaction with the other kids at school. You know, sometimes we start unfortunately seeing when a child's been abused, then they have some, they, they exhibit some problematic sexual behaviors with other children in the school. So those are really things to watch out for. Even things like an older child starting to um, have accidents or wetting the bed at night, uh, those can be those can be symptoms of a problem. So I really just you know focus on the child's behavior, and that's one thing with COVID that you know going virtual uh, is really an issue. It's it's much harder for teachers to really focus on a child's behavior when they're not sitting right directly in front of them. So I tell parents and, and um, you know, teachers, counselors, whoever, really try to, try to focus on the child, even if it's virtually, and, and watch their behaviors. You'll notice if something's different, if you know that child. Such good. And, no, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Gail, but going back also to the prevention side, I mean, the one thing that I cannot stress enough to parents and other adults in our community is talking about the problem. And that to me is one of the biggest barriers that we face with ending abuse of any sort, especially child sexual abuse. People don't want to talk about it. It's not a pretty subject. It's not a nice subject. We don't want to think that it's happening. We especially don't want to think that it's happening to our children in our own backyards. But the reality is, it is happening. And until we face that, until we start talking about it, we're never going to be able to pre prevent it. And it's the same thing if you suspect that somebody has been a victim, you have to talk to somebody about it. You have to report it to somebody. You have to ask the child questions. But talking about it is the absolute key. And, and, you know, the FBI also reports that one in five children who log on to an electronic device will be sexually solicited. To me, that's a horrifying statistic, horrifying, especially in the age we're living in right now with COVID and just technology in general. So I always encourage parents to figure out what your kids are doing, 
understand how you can you can install the privacy protections and all the different protections on different devices so that your child can't access certain things. Watch what your children are doing on their devices. If your children is playing games, if your child's playing games on the devices, get on and play a game with them so you see how they're interacting. I know my uh, stepson, who's now 21, but he used to play with his headphones on all the time, his Nintendo. And I would be like, you know, I want to I want to know who's on the other end of those headphones. Um, unfortunately, you know, we have we see a lot of children who are solicited via social media apps. Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it might be, whatever, I'm not cool. So whatever the cool apps are, social media apps are these days, but it happens, you know, your child thinks they're talking to another child on those and it turns out they're talking to an adult. And so I know parents are so overburdened with so many things these days, but we have to pay attention to what our kids are doing online. Such powerful advice. You are cool, my friend. And we are here on the Game of Life <laughs> Mentoring Podcast with the cool, the dynamic, the CEO of Christy House, Amanda Altman. And Amanda, uh, speaking of just something that was cool, to help educate uh, this, our community and to inform our community. We teamed up for a powerful op-ed. I'm a little yes. biased, but I thought it was a powerful op-ed. Just I really agree. Letting, <laughs> letting folks know that, you know, adverse childhood experiences, ACEs as they're called, or referred to, uh, is real social isolation and here we are getting ready for another summer uh and the summer the first summer hopefully post covid you know if you will we'll get into some summer programming in just a minute and some discussions but let me just ask you this you know as you know research is very clear on how uh the role of mentoring and addressing and mitigating uh the aces the traumatic uh, experiences that our children have faced. Uh, so talk to me from your perspective, your expert perspective, perspective, excuse me, on how significant and how important it is to have a consistent caring adult in a child's life. Oh my gosh, I can't, I mean, you can't even stress the importance of that enough, Gail. So as I mentioned before, you know, one of the things we do at Christie House is really work with the families to try to stabilize the household as much as possible, because it's so incredibly important for these children to feel secure and to feel like they have a stable environment. And that's what a mentor provides for these kids, right? Even if it's not somebody in their home, you know, if it's a big brother or a big sister through your organization, that person provides stability and security in that child's life. They may also give them experiences that they would never get to have otherwise and be able to teach them things that are just critical. We see so many kids who aren't learning common sense things because they don't have a good role model in their lives to teach them those things. You know, one of the things that we have at Christie House is it's called Project Gold, and that stands for Girls Owning Their Lives and Dreams. That's our program for girls who have been victims of traffic or who are at high risk for being trafficked. And that's a huge part of our program is it is led by survivor mentors. And having those people who have been through something similar in their lives, who have come out on the other side and are now successful, you know, people in society mentoring those girls, it is the most powerful thing. So I... I can't stress enough just how important it is to for these young kids to have mentors in their lives. It can it can just make a huge difference in their outcome. And I look so forward to just doing more uh, with you. And we will talk about that in just in just a few minutes as well. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that you mentioned that is so powerful, folks, we got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Having the uncomfortable <laughs> conversations helps us address it. These children are hurting. These children need us. Uh, and I'm so thankful that you included in there that the social justice conversation. It is traumatic. As a Black man leading this organization, it is my privilege, but also responsibility to make sure that not only just children who look like me and come from the lived experiences that I've faced, and I faced trauma in my life by virtue of just being a Black man. Being a black boy growing up in challenging neighborhoods and just being exposed to the reality of racism. So the reality of sexual abuse, the reality of physical abuse and exploitation, uh, we have to work together, talk about it openly and honestly, so that our kids can come out 
stronger on the other side because they're resilient. Our children are resilient, Amanda. They are. And I just, I love what you just said, Gail. We have to be comfortable being uncomfortable and having the uncomfortable conversations. I mean, that is the key. It's the key to a lot of things in life, but it's, it is definitely the key to ridding our society of these evils that we're facing in terms of child sexual abuse and sex trafficking. Absolutely. As we prepare for another summer, and the summer of 2020 was, was sad uh, in that uh, we had so much going on, uh, social justice, so much going on in terms of kids uh, thinking about, you think summer camps and it, things being shut down just so we could remain safe. As we prepare for the summer of 2021, Amanda, uh, hopefully post COVID, how do we continue to help our children socially and emotionally? It's a great question, Gail. So, so first of all, I really hope that our kids are going to be able to get out a little more this summer than they were able to last summer. So hopefully summer camps will be available. Some summer enrichment activities will be available. Our kids need socialization. It is such a key to their mental health. But again, you know, just going back to what we've been talking about, we need to be able to talk to our kids. And if we think that our kids are having trouble, if our kids seem like they're depressed even or anxious, and, and we all are feeling that way right now. Even as an adult, I've been through my peaks and valleys, certainly this past year, you know, but we need to get our kids help. And we're so fortunate, aren't we, that in our community, we have such great resources like Christy House, who can help kids who have face trauma and like Big Brothers Big Sisters, who can provide those much needed mentors. So I really encourage everybody, especially our parents, take advantages of the services that we have here. All of Christie House services are offered free of charge. We won't charge you anything, whether you can afford it or you can't. Everything's free of charge. And so reach out to us. If you think your child is struggling at all, reach out to us or, or reach out to Big Brothers Big Sisters and find that mentor for your child. You know, I just, I feel like we're so lucky to live in, in this community, right? We have wonderful organizations who have amazing leaders like you, Gail, and we just need people to take advantage of those resources that are available because they can make a difference. So I really hope that this summer, as everybody's coming out of their COVID fog, you know, the first thing is pay attention to what your children are feeling and don't discount their feelings either. Even if it seems, you know, a little strange, don't discount those feelings. You know, kids can be depressed. They can have anxiety issues. And maybe they face something that you don't even know that they've been facing, you know, online bullying or general bullying are big problems our kids face today. But, but listen to your kids. And if you feel like they need help, reach out for help. There are just so many opportunities out there. Right back at you with that amazing. Uh, and one of the things we, we would say growing up on, in the context of sports, Amanda, game recognizes game. When you see somebody <laughs> say, you know, no, she's the real deal. He's the real deal. You are the real deal, my sister. And uh, right back you. at you in terms of an amazing leader leading Christy House here on the Game of Life mentoring podcast and one final question for you my friend and it's yeah. something that I want us to continue to connect the dots on obviously last year with everything being some very much limited uh, I want us to continue to partner we're in this together and I'll just toss it you just uh, give me some ideas or, or your thoughts on how uh, we big brothers bitches of Miami and Christy House can team up and continue to partner for the benefit of our youth. What are your thoughts? Oh, definitely. So number one is education. So Christy House providing education to especially your mentors, your bigs, uh, but also to the littles. And I think doing a course with the bigs and littles together would be really cool. But also, you know, we have a lot of people who come through our program and then when they become adults, they want to give back. And one thing we don't really have at Christie House is a structured mentoring program. But I think sending some of our 
our former clients to you guys to become big could be really helpful. And also sending some of our clients who could benefit from having a mentor. I mentioned that at Project Gold, we have that mentoring capability, but at Christie House, where we work with kids of all ages who have experienced abuse, we don't have a structured mentoring program. No need to reinvent the wheel because you guys do have that. So I think if we can work together to identify some of our clients, but who can be littles, but also some of our former clients who would just make excellent bigs. And I already have a person in mind who would just be wonderful and he's itching to give back. And, and that's what he wants to do is mentor kids. And so I, I just see so much opportunity there for us to work together. And I'm really looking forward to it. Well, Amanda, yes, yes, yes. I think you mentioned three specific things. Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, and I cannot stress how grateful I am to have this conversation, to team up with you on op-eds and to educate our community. We're in this together, my sister. And I just want everyone to know uh, in, in terms of Christie House, if you could give them the information, if they wanted to contact you all, What's that contact information, Amanda, for someone to reach Absolutely. out to? Absolutely. So you can reach out to us by phone at 305-547-6800 or go online at www.christiehouse.org. You can fill out a form online and somebody will get back to you or call us and, and we'll set you up right away. Excellent. 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 And it's bbbsmiami.org, bbbsmiami.org, two incredible programs, organizations that are here for you, your families, because at the end of the day, in the game of life, everybody makes the team, but how you play is up to you. Amanda, all the best, my dear. Keep it rolling. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thank you so much for having me. So great to be with you today. It's my pleasure. Take care. This is the game of life. On today's game of life, we have little sister Eliza Van Court and her incredible big sister, Alice Green, talking about the power of resilience, the power of mentoring, and the power of women. Welcome to the Game of Life Mentoring Podcast. I'm Gail Nelson, President and CEO of Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Miami, and I am thrilled as we celebrate Women's History Month. And by the way, women make history every day, not limited to a month. Every single day, women get it done. And I'm talking today to two powerful women who are getting it done. I'm so pleased to have with me today, Alice Green. Not only is she an alumna of Big Sister, but she's a former director of Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Tompkins County in New York, and we have the one and only Eliza Van Court, who is a speaker and also an author of the upcoming book, Get Ready, A Woman's Guide to Claiming Space. Stand tall, raise your voice, be heard. Ladies, welcome to the game of life. Thank you. Thank How's you that so part much for having us. That's a great introduction. Thank you so much. I want to just do it again. It felt so good as well. <laughs> <laughs> but let's let's jump in, ladies, and thank you for taking time out uh, today to be with me and to really impact not only uh, the local Big Brothers Big Sisters affiliates, but to impact in the entire world. And I mean that sincerely. Through the through the digital lens, we have the ability to not only share messages, share stories, share experiences that everybody, no matter where you are, where you live, language you speak, you can be impacted positively. And so I look so forward to this conversation today. Eliza, you have an incredible story. And as I looked at your story and read your bio, uh, I said, my goodness, let me just fasten my seatbelt and, <laughs> and prepare to be inspired. Uh, tell us about the challenges you faced and how you felt invisible. Well, you know, I was born in New York City to two parents and my mom, who is Mary Louise Marini Van Court, and my dad, Tace Van Court. And by all accounts, my mother was an amazing mother. And then at about four and a half, she became paranoid schizophrenic. And um, 
my life just completely changed. And she ended up, she really had a hard time taking in that she'd lost custody of me. So she ended up taking me three times illegally um, from New York to California. There was a national APB out on me. Once I actually, actually went from New York to Texas and twice from New York to California. One of those times we hitchhiked across the country by truck. Um, and now as a mom, I, you know, I think about um, what happened on that trip. And I, I, that was the time when I started to conflate safety with invisibility. And I think that as little girls, we're already told to be kind of small and little. And then if you put that kind of trauma on it, I was a really scared little girl. And I, you know, a lot of people talk about when I tell the story, you know, how did you get through this? You, you must be amazing. And one of the reasons I wanted Alice here is because I really don't believe that anyone is just individually amazing. Um, I just think that every single person who has an amazing story has more amazing people behind them. So I had Alice and Alice was one of the most influential people in my life. Uh, and we can get to that in a bit, but, um, but anyway, so with my book, I really started to kind of try to work on claiming space. And I spent a lot of time teaching other people how to claim space. So if you can't see this, but behind me is a door full of signatures. And those are all the students who graduated from my program. So when I, and a lot of them are my mentees and when they graduate, you know, they, I always feel the people love me or with me when I'm doing these podcasts. So uh, I spent a lot of time helping other people empower themselves, but then I got hit by a car <laughs> um, in 2014 and I had a bilateral brain injury and I lost a lot of my communication skills. I lost a lot of my ability to remember and I had to build my communication back brick by brick. And it was that process that really inspired this book. And that's when I, re I had to research and watch and listen. And I kind of cracked the code of communication and what allows people to claim space. And I wanted people to be able to know that without being hit by a car. <laughs> um, but it is worth noting that when I was in the hospital right after my head injury, Alice got there first and basically crawled into bed with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I still remember it. So she was, I was the flower girl in her wedding. She, I, you know, she went to my wedding. She was there when I hit my, I mean, we've just been there. She's been there my whole life. And I feel like I'm very blessed. I feel like I'm very blessed. Wow. Alice, uh, what motivated you to be a big sister to this incredible, and at the time, that incredible little girl? And you see this a uh, powerful woman in, in, in front of us today. I um, feel so blessed that uh, it turned out that Eliza became my little sister. She was matched with somebody else in the Big Brother Big Sister program that I directed. And that person went on vacation and asked me if I would spend a little bit of time with her little sister while she was away. 43 years later, <laughs> <laughs> still <laughs> spending time regularly. I, uh, I just, uh, I got to meet Eliza when she was six, just about to turn seven. And um, in the early days when we would spend time together, I came all motivated with all kinds of activities because I supervised other big brothers and big sisters. So I knew, you know, all the fun things to do for pairs. And Eliza wanted to stay home and color. She was, she was just hanging on to me for dear life in those, in those early days that we were together. And um, I, I had this wonderful lesson in really letting go of my expectations and looking directly at what a child needed at that moment. And she really, you know, I know more now about the trauma that she had suffered um, in the years before I met her. And I just intuitively knew that I had to stay in her home and do what she wanted to do for week after week after week. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't ready to go outside and when we went outside I could just still feel the feeling of the, those little arms around my leg 
if we were <laughs> if we were greeting people if we had an event with other big brothers and big sisters i pretty much could feel claire i could feel eliza join that's my daughter <laughs> <laughs> joined at my hip and then over the years i really had the just the opportunity to see this blossoming young woman and by the time she was a teenager she was performing um on stage and in um, plays and just this just this amazing presence evolved over the early years that we were together and then later when i i retired i got a chance to take acting classes <laughs> at a, in eliza's program it, it's just been an amazing an amazing several decades <laughs> full circle um, yeah Absolutely. go ahead eliza go ahead Oh, I was just saying, you know, when I give, to, I actually was commissioned by MIT many years ago to do a talk on mentoring and also mentoring across differences. Um, and I, so that in that talk is now evolved, but um, that's how it started for the Office of Minority Education. And um, I talk about Alice in it. And what I talk about is the importance of meeting people where they're at. And it, I was a little girl who had been all over the country and I had this long curtain of hair and I kind of hid behind this long curtain of hair. And I, you know, I remember, Al, I still remember that moment when Alice came and said, oh, we could do all these things. And I remember saying, you know, I just want to color. And Alice went, okay. And she literally got on the floor with me and colored with me and listened to me. And it was like, it was revelatory. And it, I think it informed so much of my own mentorship is just the idea that, you know, it's not really about you driving the ship, it's about meeting people where they're at. And that is um, one of the most beautiful and really listening to people, really listening. And I think that's one of the gifts that Alice gave me among many. That is such a powerful lesson in terms of humanity and social justice and it, across all different types of challenges and their issues, Eliza, because she met you where you were and what you needed was that stability, that strength. And guess what? Going out wasn't all that attractive in light of the context in which you live. It's exactly. like, let's just stay put. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. The last thing I wanted to do was have an adventure. I had had plenty of adventures and I really, at that point, I, I equated adventure with danger because that's what my adventures had been. And so knowing that I could just stay in the house and she would come and we'd call her and she'd listen to me was is really, I mean, it was just one of the greatest gifts of my life, truly. Well, I think there's also a message here that to all the big sisters out there, if you call Alice and you go on vacation, <laughs> you may not have your little sister when you get back. <laughs> it's true. I mean, we, we hit it off just like, yeah. I mean, there was a time my dad had to go on a trip and I stayed at her house. I mean, you know, I, I knew her husband, Alan, you know, I mean, it was just a really special, it's very, very special. Well, speaking of special, there's a special book that's coming out that we want you to talk about, Eliza, and tell us about your upcoming book and why it is so important that women claim their space. Yeah, well, when I was recovering from my head injury, um, I was remembering the talks that I, so I, after my head injury, I started doing all of these talks and I'd started to develop like little tiny bits of things but then afterwards I started really speaking in, in earnest and women would follow me. This is gonna sound unrelated, it is not. Uh, women, speaking of meeting people where they're at, after the talks, women would follow me to the bathroom. And I, <laughs> I'd, I'd be washing my hands and a woman would sort of sidle up to me and she'd go, oh, you know, I had a question I didn't wanna ask in Q&A. And then I'd start answering it. And then another woman, and then another woman. And I started, I have gone to Hong Kong and Texas and Florida. I mean, I've been all over. And the questions are often the same. There's maybe 40 of the same questions that get asked every time and you know, same story, different facts. And I started thinking, why do we have to have these conversations in the bathroom? You know, because we don't feel safe speaking in the sunlight. Like, is, and what would happen if I took all of these experiences and brought them into the sunlight? So after my accident, I started thinking, oh, you know what? I can plunk these into buckets. There are maybe five themes and each one of these fits into one of them. And that is what claiming space is. And if, if you want, I can kind of go through what all five are because to me that is, it's very important for people to kind of know these, these things. So if you- Please, by all means, go ahead. Okay. So 
the basic idea of claiming space is claiming space is living the life of your choosing unapologetically and bravely, which sounds easier than it is. <laughs> so there are five ways to go about this. The first is you're going to claim space with your physicality. So really own your voice, learn how to take up space with your body, don't make yourself small. The second, and this is where mentorship comes in, is, is claiming space together, you know, making sure that you are connecting. And when people say networking, they often think of this, you know, almost mercenary thing, like I'm gonna get to know you and then you'll help me with this. And I find those networks aren't very strong and they don't really nurture you. Uh, so really connecting is A, knowing who not to let into your network, not to let your anti-mentors into your network, but you know, people who will actually poison your network, but then also who to let into your network and really form true and real connections with people you like, um, because those are the relationships that will stick with you forever. Um, and then the next one is don't seed space. Often, and I know this from my own experience, we have baggage from our lives and you know they they can it can follow you and you can find yourself reacting to things that really don't come from the external situation it comes from your own stuff so understanding that and then the other one is protecting your space so dealing with aggressors and and this tends to be a lot more of a challenge for women of color um, because they face challenges that are much greater than white women but all women do definitely face that to different extents and then the final one is claiming space intersectionally, uh, making sure that you are claiming space across differences. And what I found was women who had a real commitment, not just to themselves, not just to people who looked like them, but to all women actually were the women who claimed space best. And so you can, and what I say is you can't claim space with a one woman army and that when we rise together, we rise so much higher. So those are the five things. And then in the book, it talks, each one has several sections on, well, how do you do this? I look forward to not only getting the book, but reading it with my daughter uh, as yes. well. Uh, my baby girl graduates, shout out to Alexis Nelson, who graduates from high school uh, this year. And she's, there, I got three bodyguards and one princess. And, uh, <laughs> I, I like my sons. I love my daughter. No, I love all my kids. <laughs> but she, she is the princess, that is for sure. Aww. And we're here on the Game of Life Mentoring Podcast with big sister Alice and little sister Eliza. And we're talking about just the power of women as we celebrate Women's History Month. I will say again for the record, if you think women make history just one month, they make history every day. So just look around. It's easy to see. Alice, speaking mm -hmm. of making history and seeing someone blossom. You touched on it earlier. When you saw this little girl, you felt her clinging to your leg. How did your relationship develop? And again, as you look at Eliza now as a, as a, as a mom, uh, I know it's gotta warm your heart. <laughs> it sure does. And it, it, it makes me, listening to this conversation mm -hmm. reminds me of talking with big brothers and big sisters that I supervised over the years. And I think many of the people who volunteered um, came to the volunteering work thinking that they were going to do all the giving. <laughs> and I think listeners and watchers can probably uh, imagine how much I've learned from Eliza over the years. Um, she and I have become such deep friends in such a mutual way. I, I do remember a point um, when I was pregnant with my first child and Eliza was maybe 12 and we were, uh, I was tired <laughs> in my last trimester. I remember Eliza just sitting me down in a garden where we were walking and saying, let me give you a shoulder rub. And it was just this glimpse into this person who'd been so inward but she had this deep compassion and she just was giving to me this this physical comfort as a, as a very pregnant woman and um I saw this power and capacity that really was so veiled by that long hair I remember braiding it um it just slowly emerge, especially through performing in, in high school years. Eliza got 
you know, kind of too big, busy for seeing me every single week after <laughs> I became a teenager. Um, so maybe seven years, we saw each other every week for at least three hours. Um, and then less in high school and less in college when she went away, but still we got together. We got together, you know, when my children were little, we got together when Eliza had, um, was married and then had children. And every time we got together, there was a new learning from what Eliza was exploring. And, you know, just their, their generational things that somebody, you know, I'm in moving into my mid seventies. There are things that I just don't know about or wouldn't know about if it weren't for someone from Eliza's generation who just has is taken up this work um, on behalf of women and also men, young people. I go to her for advice when I have family issues. Um, it's been a really, really mutual relationship. When one person mentors, two lives are changed. And I love what you just said, Alice. So many bigs come to us all across this country and say, I'm seeking to help a child and all the, it was, it was sincerity and, and, and genuineness, but little do they know that it goes, it works both ways. I, I have to say in my um, life, mentoring is one of the biggest parts of my life. And, you know, that is directly as an outgrowth of Alice, of course, but, um, and I always tell people you get more out of it. And when you, when you look through my book, I have about six cartoons in the book and a lot of the people who are cartoon particularly the younger people are um, my mentees uh, I wanted them to be in my book living in my book so you, you know you're gonna see Prachi and Kieran and Marana and all my you know it's just it's really Daryl Johnson you know so many people who I just know and love who I met as a teacher or because they were my neighbor and um, I, I think that mentorship goes I actually think it's part of the fabric of society and we've moved a bit away from the village. And if we actively work to be a village, you know, more, it would be so much better. And the example I always give, and this actually comes from my friend, Kim Munson Burke is when you're a mother, you think you're going to be good at every stage. You really want to be good at every stage. I think parents all want to. And Kim said, you know, it's so silly because of course there are people who love the toddler stage and there's no shame that like the teenage stage was hard. But we, when we had the village, you could say, go to Kate's house, like hang out, you're a teenager and I'll take, you know, Jane's toddler for a little while. And there was much more of a synergy. And, and I think that the more we can create these spaces where families are supporting each other in all kinds of mentorship, you know, parallel mentorship, mother to mother, you know, vertical mentorship, it, it just, it makes such a, it's, it's, it's profound. It really is profound. Eliza, you touched on it. And uh, as we see you and your, your big Alice here today, and your guys are family, but oh, yeah. you not only overcame so many challenges uh, with the help of mentorship, but you give back in so many ways. You touched on it earlier with the names of the of your mentees, if you will, that are on the wall. So it's a visual reminder, a daily reminder to you. Give us a couple examples of, and talk to us on how uh, you continue to give back in the mentoring space. Well, for me, teacher, teaching acting is, is very um, emotional. It's very intimate. It's, it's, and so you really do learn a lot about people and acting teachers can be actually pretty awful because they have a lot of power. Or, and, or they can make a huge difference in somebody's life. And for me, I, I always thought, you know, this is my opportunity to make a big difference. So when I mentor, I actually have my studio attached. When I teach at my studio, we perform at Cornell University, but my studio is attached to my house. And every break, I take somebody up into my kitchen and I just sit and talk with them. And my, I, and, I mean, I have so many mentees. It's hard sometimes to keep, to keep up with everybody, but it, it's, it's, different people have different needs. And then when I started speaking, um, my favorite example of this, and this happens a lot, and I actually try, I have a rule now that I will not, I will not have more than one mentee that enters my life per speech because it gets to be a lot. Um, and I just fall in love with the people I work with, but I was working at one of the biggest universities in the country. And I'm not going to say the name just because I don't want to have any way to tell this person's story because I 
don't believe in telling someone's story without their permission. But I was working at this huge university and afterwards, and this kid came in and he was really just, you know, kind of glaring at me the whole time. So I thought, well, now this one, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to crack. And so I, I had him be my timekeeper. And then at the end, he waited till everybody was gone. He was lying on the table, looking, you know, at the person who'd run it, like kick me off the table. Fine. And afterwards he said, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, sure. And I'd given them an exercise about imposter syndrome. And he said, we started walking and he looked at me and he said, what if it doesn't work? I still remember this. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, that imposter syndrome thing you talked about, he, he's a young man of color. He said, every day the white kids tell me that I'm not supposed to be here or they tell me I'm lucky to be here. And I said, and then he started telling me his story and it turns out that he was an orphan. Like his, he'd lost both his parents, one to drug addiction and one to just never around. And he'd grown up in a school system that was absolutely atrocious. And he had made it to one of the top five universities in the world. And I said to him, you know, you're, <laughs> you are not like lucky. Everyone else is lucky because they had every opportunity and that's why they're here. You got, you earned your spot. And so then <laughs> afterwards, I, he said, hey, can I, um, I said, why don't you connect with me on Facebook? Because I was trying not to kind of <laughs> have another mentee. And he said, well, he, and he teased me because I'd said I was old throughout the whole seminar. And he said, I'm not old like you. I don't do Facebook. <laughs> so I said, okay, here's my number. And then two days later, I get this text from him. And he said, hey, I wanted you to know I did what you told me. And I started writing in a journal. I also want you to know that I'm sure your other seminars at the school weren't as good as mine, but that's okay. And then he kind of paused, then he has dot, dot, dot. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I don't dislike you. <laughs> and I thought this was like for him, this was such a big deal. And it emerged into, a, and I said, well, that's awesome. And now I ended up helping him get into an overseas program, which he would never have gotten into. And we have become, you know, he's become my mentee. This was like four years ago. He still calls me for advice. And, you know, it really occurred to me that I, as a white woman who comes from a level of privilege, my parents are teaching me all this stuff. Here's how you write an email. Here's how you talk to authority. Here's how you do this thing. He has zero help with that. And so I've sort of stepped into that role of teaching him how to navigate all of these systems that he never had any mentorship on. And so I think um, for me, part of mentorship is filling in the gaps that society create for people who, and, and that basically I feel it's a setup. Um, there's a setup that certain groups are perpetuating their power. And the only, one of the main ways to disrupt that is to give other people the knowledge that those groups have. And so to me, that's a huge part of mentorship. So I end up mentoring all over the country because every time I go somewhere, I meet somebody and have a conversation, but it's, it's a huge part of my life. And it's one of the, as Alice said, um, I ended up getting to know this young man very well. And he checks me now all the time on stuff. And I've learned so much from him and it's been one of the gifts of my life. So I know that's kind of a long story, but I guess the moral of that story to me is you know, keep your heart open because you never know where you're going to find the next person who's going to change your life because you're blessed to mentor them. That story was powerful. And, and let me tell you, uh, mutual trust and respect. And as I sit here as a black man, that's a president and CEO of Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Miami, uh, seeing and hearing stories that are just based, that are just rooted and grounded in just caring for somebody else. And being open and honest enough and authentic, uh, it, I just can't, it, it's so refreshing. And I can see uh, why he did not dislike you. <laughs> that was my favorite text I've ever got. I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't dislike you. <laughs> I'm using that. Like, I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> well, let me say this, ladies, here on the Game of Life Mentoring Podcast, Alice and Eliza, I don't dislike you. So we will continue yes! with Right back to you. <laughs> don't dislike you either. <laughs> oh my. Uh, Alice, your resume, I looked at it and so impressive. Uh, uh, really, uh, the service 
uh, that you have given back to your respective communities in which you live, the love that you've shared with Eliza and so many others, the dedication to our branded Big Brothers Big Sisters, uh, from the one-to-one -one family support that led to Big Brothers Big Sisters of Tompkins County. I mean, wow. So just thank you for <laughs> just your dedication and commitment to community, to family, and to our children. And in light of, and it's so, it's so appropriate that Eliza talked about just one example of a young man that's doing his thing, that's teaching, but also being a recipient of the love and the mentorship that Eliza has shown toward him. In light of the social justice issues and so many issues facing our nation, how important is it to have organizations like Big Brothers Big Sisters? So it is so important. I can't recommend to people around the country enough the, um, the value to our society in, in this kind of volunteer work. It is a chance to have a ripple effect that never stops. Let me let that simmer for just a minute. A ripple effect that never stops. Uh, wow. I told you I was, I always pay tribute to my grandmother and she was some kind of cook, Alice. And <laughs> so I wanna let that just simmer for just a minute. A ripple effect that does not stop. And you and Eliza are a perfect example of that. I mean, I've never met you two in my life and now we're family, you're stuck with me now. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but having said that- I love that. <laughs> having said that, Eliza, there are so many littles across this country that are faced with so many challenges pre-pandemic as we deal with so many challenges and issues, you know, what I call COVID-19, racism 2020, uh, entitlement, privilege, just uh, our, our littles need to stand up and be heard. So you have the floor and the closing statement on this podcast. Talk to our littles, no matter where they live, no matter who they are. Eliza, little sister Eliza, that's all grown up. <laughs> with a big smile and full of confidence, Alice. <laughs> Eliza, the floor, the stage is yours. Well, I guess the first thing I would say is this is on my mug and this is my favorite mug and it says, don't quit your daydream. So I love, it's my favorite mug. And I would say that dream big, but understand that you don't have to do it alone. And that you can, all, you know, it's important to learn that your community is there to support you. Find the people in your life. Find, seek out people in your life who see you and believe in you. Because those are the, you know, you have it in you to do it yourself. You have it in it to do it. But what you need is other people who see that inside of you. Because it's not that you need help because you, you don't have it. They're not going to create it for you but they are going to help you realize that you can do anything because being seen is one of the most powerful things. So find the people that see you and then don't quit your daydream. Do what you love and success will follow. Ladies, it has been my absolute pleasure to spend this time with you both today. Alice, for your service to the community. Eliza, you have all, you've grown up and now you are leading and mentoring and making this world a better place every single day. So you need a bigger wall because you're gonna need some more space. Some <laughs> more names. <laughs> I have guys. another door over there, so. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and so for those that are listening, no matter where you live, bbbs.org, get involved in your local community. I'm Gail Nelson, President and CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Miami. It has been my absolute pleasure to be with two powerful women as we celebrate Women's History Month, as we celebrate you. You're not invisible. Stand up, stand tall, be heard, because in the game of life, everybody makes the team, but how you play is up to you. Ladies, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Gail. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. This is the game of life. Thank <laughs> you.